Hi, everyone. Welcome back from uh, spring break. want to move into the next lecture, which is uh, chapter 15 on uh, the revival of classical architecture, uh, which the chapter labels and we refer to as neoclassicism. Neo meaning we're returning again to classicism. Uh, some of the ideas of proportion, form, style, um, for, um, assemblage uh, that uh, are underpinned in what the Greeks and the Romans were doing in classical antiquity. Um, if you are following along in the book, this is chapter 15, um, and I want to jump in. <clears throat> so... In the 19th century, um, there was a return to, uh, as I mentioned, the styles of the Greeks and the Romans. Um, and part of the reasons why uh, there was a, a renewed interest in classical ideas is that there was a lot of archaeological, the, the book cites a couple of different um, uh, reasons. Number one is archaeological discovery. There was a lot of uh, archaeological activity taking place in the early, uh, well, throughout the entire 19th century, uh, and obviously continuing on into the 20th, 20th and 21st centuries. Um, but we're starting to uncover a lot of what um, what was built, a lot of the architecture that was built before um, that we didn't we didn't know about. And there's a greater appreciation and a fondness. I mean, that's just kind of human nature that when you uh, w when you find something that is that is old um, that you you didn't know existed, or you uncover it, or you dig it up, or you find it after it's been lost for a long time, um, you tend to have kind of nostalgia about it. So that's essentially what's happening um, in Europe, and uh, we'll see the effects on America towards the end of the lecture. Um, but that's effectively what's happening in the neoclassical era in the 19th century. There are a couple of, of other major uh, world events that take place that, uh, that the book cites, and, and I want to highlight because they're important and they uh, contribute both to neoclassicism as well as to the Beaux-Arts. Uh, and then we'll learn here uh, pretty soon um, will even impact modernism and uh, postmodernism. And those are the, well, the second of the two uh, has uh, ripple effects for uh, another couple hundred years. The first is the French Revolution, uh, but the second is the Industrial Revolution. Um, let's see. Yeah, I have slides for that, but I can uh, kind of continue with the intro and then jump into the next project. Um the French Revolution, 1789 to about 1799, so a period of about 10 years. Uh, the industrial, well, let me stick on the French Revolution quickly. Um, the, the things that the book points out, I'm not a historian, I'm not an expert on uh, European history, but the French Revolution was basically a movement that led to um, greater democratization, um, elimination of sort of feudal, um, feudal methods, feudal ways of living, um, <coughs> greater, greater control. Um, I shouldn't say control, but greater ability, uh, and greater right given to government to create, um, to be responsible for the creation of, uh, public buildings, education buildings, buildings of higher learning, um, things that, um, government buildings, civic buildings, theaters, etc. Things that the um, uh, the government didn't really take the responsibility for prior to, uh, which obviously has uh, architectural implications in that uh, uh, banking is another one, by the way. Um, more schools are built, more banks are built, more colleges are built, uh, roads, water, sanitation. Government takes responsibility as part of the French Revolution to start to uh, kind of uh, produce more of this for the common good of the people is is the sort of underlying idea of the of the French Revolution, the Industrial Revolution, uh, which 
isn't necessarily associated with one particular country, the United Kingdom, England, even the United States, Germany in large part participates in the Industrial Revolution, uh, and France uh, to a large degree. But the Industrial Revolution is, is less a societal revolution and more of a technological revolution. Um, and that's basically the, the time in history where we move, um, we modernize our uh, our technology and move from making things by hand to put it very broadly uh, to learning to make machines that can make things that we used to make by hand. So um, I think the book uses the frame uh, phrase the transition from making things by hand to making things by machine. Put it to put it very simply. Um, and this emancipates this idea of universal access uh, to all universal and accessible to all. So it's like everything that we've studied so far, what is happening in the world often uh, almost exclusively um, will impact the architecture. So if the if society is interested in things that are more universally accessible, then it will follow uh, that the architecture should be universally accessible. What that means to large degree is that um, there's, I would describe it a little bit as a simplification um, or a, um, a turning away a little bit of some of the ornamentation, the detail, the certainly um, a lot of what we looked at from the Baroque recently uh, or going back to high Renaissance, kind of going away from that idea of the sort of the gilded, the ornate, the decorative, uh, and stripping it down, maybe not so much as the, um, as was done in the Protestant Reformation, but by doing so, uh, trying to convey the idea that the, that the architecture, the spaces that the architecture are serving are really for all and not just for uh, an elite. Um, so, you know, back to, back to Rome, uh, back to Greece, in effect. <coughs> French Revolution, the idea of emancipation, elimination of feudal class, and really empowering uh, the working class and the working man uh, with rights that um, were before limited uh, or non-existent at all um, and industrial revolution um, bringing about the notion that we can now mass produce uh, we can uh, we can uh, make steel we can make glass or we can rapid uh, prototype or rapid make uh, a lot of those things that either before were really hard to come across or couldn't be produced in abundance uh, at least not in a condensed short period of time uh, and that will allow for the architecture to um, achieve a greater scale as well as a, a completely different quality than what we've uh, seen up to now Okay, this man, Jean-Nicolas Louis Durand, um, uh, an important architect um, because the book starts with the French Revolution and then pivots to the Industrial Revolution. We're going to stick with France for, uh, here in the intro or in the beginning. So Durand is a French architect, lived from 1760 to 1834. Uh, he was an author, uh, he was an architect, and he was a teacher. Um, he taught um, uh, architecture and engineering um, at the Ecole uh, Polytechnique. He is also strongly associated with neoclassical architecture. Um, he, uh, he was known to, uh, to create buildings that had a sense of universal universality. Uh, and the key point with Durand is that he broke... The key point with Durand is that he broke from the notion of uh, the Vitruvian values of firmness, commodity, delight, firmitas, utilitas, ebenustas, uh, the notion that a building should move uh, us in, in terms of 
uh, having a character in terms of having an ability to, um, to enact, um, phenomenological, um, or emotional response from us to lift our, to our spirit, um, which are all good things. Uh, but Durant and Durant doesn't, um, Durant recognizes architecture's ability to do those things, but he basically says, um, that's not my job as an architect, or that's not architecture's role. It's rather uh, the opposite, which is economy, simplicity, and convenience. <coughs> Pardon me. I want to repeat that and kind of uh, put those uh, phrases against one another uh, again. So Vitruvius, uh, who uh, coined the term firmitas utilitas ebenustas, firmness, commodity, and delight, as I think I've covered in prior lectures, um, but basically in firmness that the building should should look like it's standing up. The building should look strong, should look impenetrable. Um, uh, utility, it, it, should, uh, it should function, it should serve its intended purpose. Um, and Benustas, uh, it should, it should bring delight to, to man. Durand, on the other hand, is saying it should be economy, simplicity, and convenience. So the building should not be expensive. Um, it should not look like, uh, the palace at Versailles or Chartres Cathedral. It should look, um, look like it cost less to build, like it was more economical. Uh, it should be simple. It shouldn't be complicated. So that's kind of a direct, uh, direct attack against the Baroque. Um, and it should, it should have convenience. The way a space moves, you know, adjacencies of spaces, uh, where bathrooms are located, how one gets up to the building or moves into the building, they should not be overly complicated. Um, Durand trained originally under Etienne Louis Boulet. I think I've presented a Louis Boulet project, the most famous of which is the Newtonian Cenotaph, uh, which is a, uh, an amazing seminal, um, project in architecture, which is basically a monument dedicated to Sir Isaac Newton. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, so he trained under an architect who actually believed in the sort of emotive um, ability and the emotive power of architecture. But, you know, he did. And as often happens, uh, people who train under someone uh, learn their values, uh, oftentimes even embody those same values. But at some point start to develop, uh, oftentimes will develop their own character, either based on or in response to uh, those values. So while he trains under Louis, Louis Boulet, who's a clear formalist, is about purity of form and simplicity of form um, uh, and, you know, um, magnificence and, and uh, interesting volume and spatial quality, Durand uh, brings us this notion that um, gener the generator of design actually can be a very structured grid system. And so the design doesn't have to come from something abstract or something um, out of the blue, or it doesn't have to come from um, uh, some sort of a representation of the family, the patron, uh, the church, God, higher powers, etc. Uh, rather that we could use a grid system as the generator uh, of the design. And so he's showing us this in some of his studies, both in plan as well as in elevation and section, which isn't too different from the idea of, uh, of the Greek orders and the proportions that the Greeks uh, originally laid out for us uh, thousands of years, even before, uh, before Durant. Uh, this is another study that's actually in one of his publications, and I should mention the name of the publication... <clears throat> Economy simply Anthony Louis Boulet objected to Boulet's character. Oh, I didn't I didn't don't have the name of the of the text. Um but this is from his publication, which is um basically a, a kind of a post-rational study. What he's doing here is he's taking important buildings from the past and he's uh superimposing one of the vocabulary terms from the last uh the last section of the course 
you'll remember maybe was superimposition, the notion of laying something over one another to you know, with an express purpose of you know getting from one step to the next. Uh, so in this case, um, you superimposing or laying over a grid over um, studies of of architecture uh, built from the past as a way to kind of convince us of his argument that really a grid system can be used as the basis of design uh, for anything. Uh, oh, there's uh, Louis Boulay's uh, Cenotaph for Newton, which is a theoretical project, was never built. Uh, and this is another uh, one of Louis Boulay's examples. This is a temple or theater, I should say. Um, but the the simplicity and the purity of form is... is um, is undeniable. I mean, this is clearly a uh, cylinder with a dome set atop it. This is an even simpler, simpler, uh, purer form, which is basically a, a cylinder, a uh, sphere, I should say. <coughs> <coughs> Perfectly rounded sphere. Okay. Um, one of Dur another one of Durant's projects is this project, the Temple of Equality. This is 1796. This is in France. This is a competition that Durand wins. Durand has a, a very successful career uh, as an architect, um, but this is one of uh, this is a, an important competition that Durand wins with a uh, with a partner, Louis Michel Thibault. Um, I would say it's really Durand uh, that you need to remember, Jean Nicolas Louis Durand. Um, but we see that idea of pure form of simplification, uh, lack of detail. So we're seeing, uh, six paired, or I'm sorry, six, uh, columns, um, held up by a pediment, very clear reference to, uh, Greek antiquity or Greek architecture. Um, the stepped base, um, again, very clean, very sort of logical, straightforward approach uh, to the building. The columns themselves are interesting in that they're square. We've seen uh, 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 quite a bit, almost exclusively, uh, round columns, fluted round columns, uh, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, composite, etc. Um, but not once have we seen yet uh, use of a column as a square. Uh, so Durand is giving us that and kind of exploring within within his his rule system. So creativity is still there. I guess that's the the large point. Is yes, he's he's arguing for a a more rational basis and design, but that's not. Um, you know, he's not saying there isn't room for creativity. In fact, the book makes this point uh, and tells us that. Um, the early neoclassicists like Durand were, uh, were, were they, they found it very important to emphasize the, um, the need to create new and not necessarily to copy. So this is a perfect example at the Temple of Antiquity where Durand is basically making a reference to the column or he's uh, he's showing us that that's an important time period in history and the architecture of that time period in history is so magnificent that it should be referenced but it shouldn't be copied and so what he's doing is he's taking the round column and he's making it a square that's one idea um, the um, the capitals I want to draw your attention to the capitals of the column there's uh, what look like human figures at the top of each of these. Um, and that's, it's basically a uh, signing. He's, um, he's basically telling us that the temple of antiquity, uh, in antiquity are virtues and the virtues that each of those capitals represent are, uh, wisdom, economy, work, uh, peace, courage, and prudence. So he's in fact using the building to convey or to sign, uh, a message about, um, virtuosity, which he also believes was a core principle of classical Greek architecture. Uh, oh, the, the book is here. It is. I did have it in my notes. So the book, the Durand book is L'Ecole Polytechnique. <coughs> <coughs> okay. 
Next project. This is so we're moving kind of from France now into Germany. This is the Brandenburg Gate. This is built in the 1780s in Berlin. Architect here is Karl Gothard Langhans, C A R L G O I T H A R L A N G H A N S. Langhans lived 1732 to 1808. Um, uh, was another German architect uh, who embraced neoclassicism. Uh, here we see, um, again, six, uh, here Doric, not square, but uh, uh, six columns nonetheless, uh, creating a portico, um, all supporting a large uh, entablature, a stepped entablature, a tiered entablature, you might call it, um, on top. Uh, and the, the 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 portico itself, or the uh, the gate, uh, the passage itself, is flanked by these two smaller um, gabled. You, you can't you, you see it best in this slide. So it's kind of flanked by these two smaller um, colonnaded structures on on either side. Uh, and again, here you you know by now when we see this, and the book says that it evokes Athens. Um, I think we know very clearly what what that means. Uh, and again, signing. Um, so signing, I didn't explain, but I mentioned it earlier, and I'm going to um, uh, uh, use the point to talk about the, um, the the figure at the top. But what the architect is, and when, when I say signing, we're talking about a branch of of semiotics where. Um, sign signifier signified where we as architects it's it's a it's um, part of philosophy also or, and and linguistics and so people uh, poets use this authors use this um, but certainly architects use this is they put something on a building um, or or design something a certain way to evoke in your mind another thing which is to convey the idea and here um, the sculpture on top. So the architecture itself is um, is certainly evoking Greek architecture. But in case you're not familiar with it or you don't have any pre, um, uh, pre prior knowledge about Greek architecture, if you're um, you know an average eight, nine, ten year old who hasn't quite studied uh, those things yet or hasn't seen those things yet in life, um, there's um, signing up top of uh, a Greek god in, in, a, in a chariot being pulled by horses to more clearly convey to you that that's what the, 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 um, that's the idea that this architecture is uh, pursuing or try to, trying to uh, embody uh, Greek neoclassical or Greek classical ideas. So that's a, a common technique, and and um, um, was used is used here the same way by uh, by Durant. <coughs> <coughs> okay, uh, Brandenburg gates are very important, and um, it, they're so important that um, they they get their own stamp uh, by the German post office. Uh, Post offices love architecture, so architecture does important architecture gets fe featured often uh, on post postage stamps. But um, uh, that was an example from the uh, Brandenburg Gate. Okay, um, same architect Langens. All, I'm sorry, um, going to pivot to Schinkel, another German architect, another very important German architect. Uh, does does this building, which is one of his first most prominent works, this is no Neue Wache, um, N-E-U-E, -E, which I believe means new in German, Wache, I don't know what Wache means, but this is built 1817, uh, and this is in Berlin. Again, the architect is Karl Friedrich Schinkel, K-A-R-L-F-R-I-E-D-R-I-C-H, Schinkel, S C H I N K E L, lived 1781 uh, to 1841. Uh, also rose to become, uh, right before this commission, uh, he actually became the Berlin city architect, which was uh, a very convenient way 
uh, to receive important commissions to, um, to get to build and stay busy. Uh, Schinkel traveled extensively to Rome uh, and to Sicily uh, and kind of throughout Italy studying, uh, sketching, uh, and really better understanding and discovering um, uh, the architecture of Rome um, before returning and, and starting to kind of uh, do his work that's called we call that the grand tour and i don't know if it's unique to architecture i'm sure um it's uh, probably also used in arts and music but it's common for uh an architect to after college maybe shortly after college sometimes during college to take an extended period of time off uh for a few weeks um if one can afford it um and has the time a couple months uh, sometimes even more where you basically go to, to Europe and travel and study and sketch and observe um, important works of architecture from the past. So Schenkel, uh, being no exception, uh, does his grand tour and brings back to Germany the ideals of classical architecture uh, and, and practices what we now recognize as neoclassical architecture. Six column Doric front, the architects of the 19th century of neoclassical architecture love the six column Doric front. Um, offset unrelieved masses, I think, are interesting to point out. So the kind of wings set back are doing a couple of things. Number one, when, when uh, the book uses the term unrelieved masses, what it's saying is that there isn't a lot of relief. So it's basically just a flat plane. Yes, it's sitting on a base and the base kind of pops out a little bit and there's some articulation and some detail there on the on the um, uh, the, the base trim or the stone trim at the base. Um, and there's certainly some detailing up top with the corbeling and the uh, and the and the um, um, <coughs> pardon me, the corbeling and the cornice. Um, but that's the top. That's the bottom, not, I would say, 90% of the surface, which is the basically body or the shaft, if you will, of the mass. So it's unrelieved. It's, it's, it's clean. It's void of um, uh, articulation, curvature, ornamentation. Um, that's one. But two, it's also acting as a framing device. So simply by setting these two masses and also pushing them slightly backward, it's basically framing and giving hierarchy to the uh, to the temple front. So kind of pay close attention uh, and and read what's happening uh, there with the architecture uh, when that's there, and try to imagine in your mind if you can uh, that that's not there, and uh, ask yourself: Does that does does it serve as a, uh, does it frame? Does it kind of um, give more attention or uh, does it change the focal point uh, more towards the middle or not, or the opposite? Um, I don't think I included an image. That's the next Schinkel project. Um, but the other thing he's doing, Schinkel is doing uh, here at Neue Wash is he is paying homage to a prior project that was a competition win, but a project that was never built, which is a um, monument to Frederick the Great, an important German uh, emperor. Um, and so the the architecture that you're seeing here, this sort of main portico element that he's designed is a fragment of the building that was the winning competition for the monument to Frederick the Great, which actually was uh, very much like a Greek temple, as you're seeing the beginning of here, uh, but set on high on a promontory, kind of evoking uh, the Acropolis um, in Athens. So Schenkel knows about that project, respects that project, was one of his uh, important predecessor architects in Germany. Uh, and so he's kind of paying homage to that project by saying that wasn't built, but I respect that work. Uh, it's an important work. I've studied that work and I'm going to represent a fragment of that work as part of this project. Again, classical references. <clears throat> Picture at night the pediment uh, 
Okay, Schenkel's next project, actually one of my favorite projects of all time, is the Altes Museum. This is 1822 in Berlin. Again, Carl Frederick Schenkel. Um, this is on uh, River Island, uh, facing the Royal Palace, if you're at all familiar with, uh, with Berlin. Uh, 18 column portico. Okay, so uh, wider, longer, lower, and probably more horizontal than anything I believe that we've looked at um, in our lectures this semester. Um, in plan, uh, which I'll show you here in a minute, there's a pantheon-like rotunda in the center. Actually, I think the, the plan of this is, is what fascinates me um, and, and why I love this uh, work by Schenkel, which I'll go to in a minute. Uh, just remember that point about the um, pantheon-like rotunda. Uh, and a, a vocabulary term for this section um, is going to be the, the word stoa, which is basically the, the, the portico that's flanked with a large open space adjacent to it that basically allows you to not just use the portico as, an, as a um, circulation device, but also creates a place um, underneath the roof, uh, but that's still an exterior space and oftentimes will look out over a courtyard as it does here. I think I may have an oblique picture. I'll come back to the plan. So this is a good example of a stoa, just a large, uh, a portico space that's set against a large kind of open courtyard space, a more ceremonial uh, portico, if you will. <coughs> so here's the rotunda, which, you know, does have a pantheonic like quality. Uh, in terms of a large cylinder, uh, the Pantheon, obviously the cylinder actually projects out even further than the entry and is, I would say, 90% of the building mass, whereas here it's a part of the building mass, but it's the prominent thing in the center. So there's some uh, certainly some similarity there. Uh, it's also what creates the, uh, the upward projection that you're seeing here beyond, uh, again, to kind of like give you a clue as to what's happening on the inside. Um, okay, there's a good quote here I wrote down uh, from Schenkel, um, and that's, uh, quote, utility is the fundamental principle of all building. So that embodies, uh, end quote, uh, principle of all building, end quote. This also embodies the sort of values of neoclassical architecture, is consistent with what uh, I mentioned earlier about Duran's values. Um, and also just kind of, uh, in a nutshell, explains pretty conveniently to you what a lot of the majority of the architects in the neoclassical era were, uh, were trying to accomplish with their design work. Um, the way he divides space, I find very interesting. Um, it's not, uh, it's not something, it's not like anything we've seen so far. There's, um, there's some exploration I can see happening in plan, uh, with the thickening of the walls, uh, which we call poche, uh, another vocabulary term, um, the sort of a, not sort of necessarily the asymmetry, but the, um, interesting relationship of like square to rectangle. There isn't a repetition of the same shape. Um, in fact, I see in plan circle, I see square, I see rectangle, and I see a very interesting interplay of those things. I see a square that's basically surrounded by rectangular spaces. Uh, I see a circle that's surrounded by, flanked by square spaces and kind of wrapped around uh, wrapped with rectangular spaces. So there's, there's certainly some, some interesting and new things happening with Schenkel, uh, here at the Altus Museum. And actually that's probably the strongest, uh, the most convincing, um, argument that he's making pantheonic like references. I mean, that's, that says it all there. <coughs> <coughs> okay. So, also around this time period, or uh, really 18th to 19th century, um, England is, so England, 
is forming a union with Scotland uh, and with Ireland to create um, what in large part is still, I mean, Ireland has, has, has changed its status a little bit. Um, and again, I'm not a historian, I'm not a geographer, but effectively the, the book I think wants us to understand the point that a new power is created in the United Kingdom. So England, Ireland, and Scotland come together to create um, what is known at the time as the United Kingdom. Uh, industrial Revolution in large part is taking, I would say this is probably the epicenter of the Industrial Revolution. And so this um, powerful entity is being created, which is going to also become um, the location for um, some important neoclassical architecture that we'll go over here. So the first one is this one, Somerset House, 1776 to 1796. This is in London. Uh, architect is William Chambers, C-H-A-M-B-E-R-S. Um, uh, similar to Schenkel getting the title of city architect in Berlin, uh, Chambers gets the title fairly early in his career of architect of the king's work. Same, different title, same idea. Uh, through that sort of position um, uh, comes the opportunity to design and build uh, some important works. Uh, he also, uh, Chambers also had traveled and had seen um, some of the work from uh, other parts of Europe. And so there's strong references to the Louvre uh, Museum uh, here with what he's doing in terms of creating a uh, uh, a courtyard that's enclosed on three sides with a prominent entrance set back uh, and then wings kind of projecting outwards. Uh, you can even make a reference to, um, to um, uh, St. Peter's. Um, Long central wing. Oh, and also the rusticated base is a clear reference to uh, some of the early humanist work that we studied. Um, oh, and a prominent dome, but a prominent dome that's uh, set slightly backwards again, or set back. Um, something we've seen lots of examples of in our prior studies. Chambers also uh, becomes an architectural educator. Uh, in, and actually here in Somerset House, he dedicates a wing of this building to what becomes the Royal Academy, uh, a university in London, and actually becomes a, <coughs> a professor of architecture at the Royal Academy. Get a sense again. Uh, also, I would say evokes some of the uh, architecture that we studied from uh, China uh, and even uh, even India and the Middle East. In terms of the use of negative space or open space, you get a slightly, I'm sorry, this image is a little bit grainy, but you get a sense of the, the rusticated base and the transition. You know, there's a clear transition from the base of the building, both in texture and color. You can't quite tell the texture, but you can tell the color from this image, uh, differentiated base from the upper three levels. Uh, this is interesting because this was an installation done at the Somerset House called, uh, I think it's called a Monument to Pollution. Um, uh, I don't know who the architect was. I didn't look it up and I don't remember this project being built. Um, although I know lots of architects use this plaza at Somerset House for installations. Um, I, I must have missed when this one was uh, was done or when the competition for this was announced uh, or when it was uh, when it was published but I found this image when I was researching images uh, to try to pull for the for the lecture of Somerset House and I thought it was interesting so I thought I'd share this kind of juxtaposition of, of this um, temporary installation which I think was called installation or, or um, um, yeah I think it was called installation to pollution. So inside of these cylinders, I think, is collecting various forms of pollution, which over a period of time is having a slightly different impact in the spaces themselves, but also kind of um, uh, 
filling up the space and, and um, um, changing the sort of textural quality of the glass or the surface that it's been created. But even just the juxtaposition of the sort of neoclassical against this uh, contemporary installation um, could be seen as a sort of, you know, uh, putting the industrial revolution up against uh, classical or putting contemporary against neoclassical. I just I thought it was interesting and thought I'd share. And actually is a good segue because one more lecture later, we're going to, I'm going to lecture on the Beaux-Arts here in the next couple of days, but immediately after we're going to jump into modernism um, and then into contemporary architecture. And so you'll see a lot more of this kind of work there. Uh, okay, I think that's it on Somerset House. <coughs> okay, uh, staying in London, uh, this is John Soane's house. This is ar uh, the architect uh, house uh, that he designs and builds uh, for himself. This is 1810 London. John Soane is J-O-H-N-S-O-A-N-E, John Soane. Uh, and he lived 1753 to 1857. And as is um, often done with architects, he uses his home as a lab, as a place to experiment and explore and test new ideas and things. And um, we'll see some of them. We'll see more on the interior, but I want to point out a couple of the exterior things first. Uh, he does an extension, a 1.5, 1.6 foot extension or one and a half foot roughly extension of the portico. So this white portion that you're seeing that's kind of pulled forward in relation to the masonry facades adjacent uh, is basically the loggia for the three vertical bays that he extended out. Uh, sorry, it's the mass that he extended out of the three vertical bays to create a loggia um, up top. Uh, used white Portland stone. Uh, so I actually remember studying this project in, uh, in architecture school and graduate school. And I remember um, my instructor pointing out um, that this is, yes, this is part of neoclassical architecture, but more importantly, what was celebrated about this is that it's, although, um, Although prior architects said in neoclassical, in their neoclassical work, that we shouldn't copy and we should try to create something new based on the past, I think characteristically to an untrained eye, um, it may look as though it's being copied. Except I think when you get to John Sohn, um, there it, there's a playfulness, I suppose, or there's a lack of kind of um, well, let's let's get into it. Play, so the play, I think the the notion of the kind of broken columns is certainly a, a tongue in cheek uh, gesture, but also the placement of them. You know, we're accustomed to we're being accustomed in the hundreds, if not thousands, of projects we've looked at this semester. We're accustomed to seeing the column basically break at horizontal bands uh, or at pediments or at, at kind of common uh, breaks horizontally in the facade, you know, base, middle, upper section. So it wouldn't be uncommon to see a column spanning here or a column spanning here. <coughs> the columns, actually the broken columns occur at kind of what would might be seen as awkward locations. Um, whether you like it or not, you can't deny that he's doing something unique or something new, uh, that really hasn't been done before. Uh, the relief here between these, okay. So these are, I would describe these as pilasters kind of offset pilasters. Um, but the way he's paired the pilasters is he's brought them very close together, but he's actually pushed back the surface in between them. Uh, and maybe even deeper than the opposite plane that those pilaster up, pilasters are up against. So I think, again, uh, some experimentation that we're seeing here. Um, and then that reveal, as it actually gets to the upper section, doesn't continue. The reveal is still there. The center alignment seems to be there, even from starting from the base. But it looks actually wider and perhaps even deeper 
judging from the uh, shadow line that's being cast. Um, and then I would say it's kind of some early Art Nouveau, uh, streamlined modern um, uh, relief or carving in the sort of geometry and the articulation of the pilasters. A um, lot of um, kind of kitsch, uh, just collection of different things, a lot of assemblage, caryatids, I think the book describes them uh, as uh, a lot of playfulness with the domes. He, he certainly was experimenting, no, no question about that in his house. Um, okay, so this is, this is a room inside the house. I think it has a name. But I oh, this is the breakfast room. Okay, so uh, a couple of the things that Sone is doing here. He, he is, Sone is fascinated with the idea of light and actually bringing more light into spaces that don't ordinarily benefit from light. So spaces that might be deep within a building uh, that don't necessarily have the luxury of getting uh, a lot of light through windows. He's experimenting with how he can fix that problem or how he can address that. So he's doing a couple of things. Number one, at the um, at the squinches uh, of the, the the transition between the really what's the column and the dome above, he's placing uh, convex mirrors, which is allowing for any light that actually comes through to kind of reflect a little bit more and and give convey the idea that there's more space. Um, he's adding things like these really thin narrow windows that act a little bit as uh, kind of deceptive devices, I would say, or I remember we had studied, which is that they're bringing light through, but you don't quite notice them. It's easy to notice, you know, that window, that window, that window, but you don't quite notice those. So they're actually, he's actually bringing light from um, maybe non-intuitive uh, planes or places. Um and then, um, and, and then actually even um, setting skylights uh, or, or bringing in light from above, but beyond the dome, that's basically allowing that light to come through and kind of fill the space from the back. I would say that's kind of a, um, it's almost like a Borromini-like uh, Baroque quality that he's, uh, he's holding on to and experimenting with there. <clears throat> Uh, so central lantern, uh, in the middle, uh, top of the dome, convex mirrors at the uh, pendentives, um, and then mirrors lining the arches, the thin mirrors lining the arches. So this is the breakfast room at John Soane's house. There's another view of it. Just really kind of flooded with, with light. <clears throat> okay. Uh, finally making our way to the United States. So I think that's part of why... Uh, the book uh, wanted to make the point about the um, establishment of the United Kingdom because through the United Kingdom really is, a, yes, it's through another revolution, um, which the British called the Great American War, which we refer to as the Revolutionary War. Um, but really, America is kind of born out of the United Kingdom, right? Um, so uh, one of the first examples of work here in the United States is this one, which is the uh, of neoclassical work, um, is the State House Boston. Uh, this is 1795, and obviously it's in Boston. Uh, this is Char architect Charles Bullfinch, which is he's recognized as really the first professional uh, American architect, practicing American architect, who also establishes the first American architectural practice. Um, Bullfinch lived 1763 to 1844, um, also did his grand tour, uh, spent a lot of time in Europe studying the work of, uh, classical Rome, classical Greece, um, other parts of Europe. Um, uh, there's reference even to Chambers, uh, Somerset house with the, um, with the state house, Boston. And I suppose we can see that. Probably most uh, strikingly, I would say with two elements. Number one is the the uh, portico, the upper level portico that sits on top of a more solid portico below, or the, the I would say the columnar portico that rests on top of the, um, the sort of masonry uh, arched portico below. Um, 
I would say there's a good strong reference there to uh, to Somerset House. You can see there. You can see there. Um, and the dome. I would say the second thing is the dome uh, kind of set back relative to the entry. <coughs> Book describes it as kind of quirky, and I, I, I suppose I understand the dome is a gilded dome, a wood-framed gilded dome. Uh, it's got this, like, high Renaissance lantern at the top, um, what look like Corinthian columns. Um, but the rest of it is actually, I would say, very restrained. So there's this, I, I, I suppose I understand as I do a kind of a closer read, um, that there's certainly experimentation. There's the architect kind of trying to discover something uh, in terms of their sort of character or their style here. So there's um, testing of a lot of different things. Um, that may be what the, what the reference is about. But, uh, you know, I would say an interesting building, no less. Uh, the way the entry is resolved is, I think, very interesting. I've talked about this before, but the treatment of the ground plane, I would say, is one of the more important things to consider uh, or an arch for an architect to consider as you uh, continue on your careers in architectural studies. Those of you that are going to continue, uh, you know, think about how your building relates to the ground plane. Um, and so I think this creates a very interesting processional where it's actually set back quite a ways, but that setback or the vertical rise is, so it's set up and back, um, which could be seen as daunting because it actually, you know, sets the building, uh, a decent walk away from, uh, from the street, but also pretty high up, but it breaks that up into, four or five different sections. So one, two, three, four sets of risers with one, two, three intermediate landings. Let me write down these terms before I forget so I can make sure and get the vocabulary terms. Stout brick body and gilded golden cupola were the two two main points from the book. <clears throat> okay, um, Thomas Jefferson, Capitol Building, uh, Richmond, Virginia. This is seventeen eighty built seventeen eighty five to seventeen ninety eight. Thomas Jefferson, who I think we all know, uh, one of the founders of the United States Constitution, Declaration of Independence, author of Declaration of Independence, first governor of Virginia, well, I think was the first secretary of state um, or was the secretary of state under Thomas Jefferson. Um, I, I'm sorry, under George Washington. Um, then also later became president, was um, is, is celebrated and well known as, uh, as an architect or as the book described, the book says amateur architect not my term, the book's term. Um, also a man who did the grand tour, also a man who developed a, an affinity for classical architecture after visiting and studying. I believe he was the ambassador to, to France, uh, the American ambassador to France for an extended period of time. So uh, spent a lot of time studying uh, some of the great work in, uh, in France, in the UK, in Italy. Um, but most of all, becomes interested in the work of Andrea Palladio, who I, I've mentioned in the past. We don't cover him in this class because he uh, predates the, uh, the Renaissance. Um, but the, um, he, he takes an affinity to uh, Palladio's villas, which have a very unique kind of a... Uh, negative space, positive space quality to them. Uh, a lot of the things we talked about with State House, uh, you know, sits on a promontory relative to the to the street. Generally, is going to be proud or, or vertically higher in relation. Uh, and use of landscape, uh, basically hugging and surrounding the building with vast landscaped uh, open spaces. 
uh, is a common uh, Palladian move. Uh, and then also exploration with the sort of round uh, shape or the cylinder with uh, superimposed into a square uh, is also a common characteristic of Palladia's work that Jefferson also adopts. Um, six, another six column portico for us here. Uh, the use of white is, is definitely a character defining feature. Um, and I, and I, I think we see, uh, express pure form. He's not really pulling punches. There's not a, a excessive amount of, uh, articulation in the form. I mean, it's a pediment, uh, that kind of carries all the way through a portico, sitting on top of a square mass uh, and then two smaller versions with four columns, but same sort of idea, pediment uh, columns <coughs> almost look like pilasters because of the pressing of the column up against the building, but it, there is still relief there. There's a gap behind. So I would say it's more properly a portico uh, with columns, not uh, pilasters. Um, again, offset framing, not framing really for you to decide, but the architect is sort of using that, uh, as a device one way or the other. There's a view from the cl a little bit closer up. You can start to see the coffering. You can see the, uh, ionic columns here. You can see the columns, you know, these are not pilasters. They're actually columns, but they're not separated too much from the facade, but separated no less. Um, the sort of, it gives you a sense of the proportion or the scale too. Uh, from this slide, you probably can't quite tell that the building is sitting what looks like goodness. You know, if that's a, if this is a five and a half foot person, uh, you know, we're talking five and a half, let's call it 10, 12, 15 you, this, it might be easily 20 feet above the ground plane here. Uh, actually I would say likely even more because of the perspective here. Um, this watercolor gives you a really, I think this was for a proposed project, um, adjacent to, but this really gives you a good sense of the sort of open space. Um, in and around the Capitol building, uh, which is a striking Palladian character defining feature. Uh, okay, and finally, to one of probably Thomas Jefferson's best known, uh, well, another well known work of Thomas Jefferson is, uh, which is a villa, which is uh, Monticello. This is built in 1809 uh, in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, uh, we see again the sort of um, riff on the temple portico, uh, the, the sort of pantheonic reference of the cylinder or the drum uh, set behind the, the temple entry. Uh, the bay ordering actually um, is one of the first times that somebody is kind of experimenting with the notion of a bay extending even onto the uh, the tholo bait or the uh, the drum of the dome <coughs> so i think there's some interesting things happening here uh using the um the upper portion of the uh of the pediment uh to actually bring a window in uh is the first example that i've seen uh first time i've seen that used the book doesn't mention anything about it but i wanted to call attention to it because Again, I think what Jefferson is doing uh, is similar in large part to what Sohn is doing in that he is creating something new from the ideals of neoclassical. He's certainly sort of um, breaking off. He's saying, I'm, here's what I'm paying attention to. Here's what I'm interested in. I like these things, but I want to make something new from it. Uh, the uh, faceting of the dome, I would say, is another a uh, good example of that. So we're looking at a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So we're looking at an octagonal dome. Um, talked about the pediments, talked about the base spacing, columns, uh, Tuscan columns. So he's kind of going to, to the simplest ordering. Um, and the use of masonry, the use of masonry without feeling the need to, uh, you know, uh, 
pure white, uh, the need for a pure white facade or, um, or, or to conceal the main construction uh, material. I think is um, is an interesting move, uh, and then the light quality of the of the interior as well is uh, I think a magnificent quality of uh, of Monticello. I've never been, hope to visit one day, but uh, haven't seen it firsthand. But I've studied it uh, quite a bit, both in my education as well as in um, teaching this course. So uh, that's it. Um, a little over an hour. So thank you for your attention. That is the work of the neoclassical time period. Again, if you're following along in the book, chapter 15, um, thank you. And we're, we'll keep moving. Next lecture will be on the Beaux Arts. If you want to read ahead, that's chapter 16.3. Uh, and then we'll get into modernism with chapter 17. Thank you.